digital station for comedy, drama, and entertainment. BBC Radio 4 Extra. Now, the second part of Leon Garfield's mystery adventure, Devil in the Fog. George is now a member of the Dexter family, a family troubled by a dark past. And now he's been surprised by a meeting with the most sinister Dexter of them all, the infamous Captain Richard. Devil in the Fog by Leon Garfield Dramatised for radio by Martin Jameson Episode 2 Who is the Principal? So, you're my long-lost nephew. Captain Richard, don't move. And call me Uncle Dexter, why don't you? Till we're better acquainted. Where is she? Who? That monstrous witch, Mrs. Montague. What makes her a witch, nephew George? Because she consorts with the devil. I'll wager that's me you're talking about. They didn't lock you in Newgate Jail for nothing. Have you come alone? No. There's a dozen following. Twenty. And you'll have a blunderbuss under your coat. I'll wager that as well. <laughs> I'll run. In this light, you'd never get a shot. <laughs> and I'll not chase you neither. Not with this leg. What's wrong with it? Did you never wrench a leg iron off your ankle? Come on, boy, help me sit. Put the pistol down. See? It's uncocked. No, no, it's a trap. As you wish. Cover your nose. Leg's starting to smell. Not very elegant for an officer nor a fugitive. Because you shot my father. I have something to ask of you, nephew George. I have no wish to be called your nephew. You ain't got twenty guineas about you. What? Ten guineas would suffice. Five. After what you've done? I left every last sixpence with your Aunt Dexter and your cousin Bertram, their need being far greater than mine. What's that? I don't know. Mr. Constables, come to hunt me down. You did betray me. Let go! Get them to go first. For whatever passes, you shall not live to sneer at me and inherit. I swear, I swear, I never knew you was here. Why should I believe you? Because no one saw me leave. Dexter, treachery is in your blood. Mr. Richard! Oh. Master George! Mrs. Montague! Madam, why did you not call out before? Looking for the law. My finger was on the trigger. Have you asked him? I don't have twenty guineas. Not the money, nephew. I might have five shillings. Do you think I bolted from Newgate and ran and limped and crawled and dragged through stinking ditches in mortal terror of everything that moved to beg five shillings from a boy? Well, then what? What do you want? A reconciliation. This is only chance. It is the only chance for my wife. For my son, Bertram. A reconciliation? With your father. You tried to kill him. It was an accident. It was a duel. One most severely provoked. But kill my own brother. Scare him, yes. Make a fool of him, yes. With a bullet in the gut. I was trying to miss. He fell into the path of my shot. Why should I believe you? You are the principal. The principal? What? Principal. The principal? Who had me kidnapped when I was a baby? And you paid Mr. Treat 60 guineas a year to keep me hidden. No, no, that's not me, nephew. I know it was you. Do you know how much a soldier is paid? Not precisely, no. You think I have 60 guineas a year for kidnapping babies when my own flesh and blood are an inch away from starvation? I suppose... It's not Captain Richard. Hearing of your return, my heart soared. That's why I risked all to escape and come here. One who can prove my innocence. The true villain will be revealed. I know him only as the principal. Well, then the principal is my enemy too. He is my accuser. He's destroyed my life. Master George, will you plead on your uncle's behalf? If the time seems right, my father's not yet recovered. Thank you, Thank you nephew George. I must go back. They'll be wondering where I am. Oh, uh, nephew. Uncle Dexter. 
do you have that five shillings? Such is the despair in my uncle's eyes that only the coldest of hearts could not believe him. It's my resolve to talk to Sir John in the morning. Perhaps, with my uncle Dexter proved innocent, we can discover the true identity of the evil principal. But when I comes down to find Sir John, there's a visitor sitting in his chair. Dear, dear George, it's a treat. Let me look at you. A gentleman. Lap of luxury, security, golden future, love all around. Couldn't wish for more. Oh, Mr. Treat, is that a bandage on your hand? Oh, that is a scratch. And you're weak. Singed. Darn it, dear. Um, singed. <laughs> singed. Which brings me to the purpose of my visit. To humbly beg of you the small sum of seventy pounds. But Sir John gave you a thousand. Gone, dear George, gone. Where are the others? They're very well, my geniuses. Very, very well. Are they in London? That sooty seat of ignorance and matchwood. Matchwood? Do not speak to me of London. But your plans, sir? The Treat family's palace of illusions? Could you not find a theatre to purchase? It was a triumph. Of course. A modest building, but well located in the Haymarket. Oh, the centre of the world. Our opening performance. Saul and the Witch in England. Oh, I wish I'd been there. With Lucifer's smoke. And the Devil's Fire. Berlin syrup. Oh, fine. Eight of nightshades. Six ounces. Six? <laughs> a spectacle was demanded. Grandeur. A fiery glory such as kings might gape at. But six ounces? It's never been chanced before. All grand and adventurous things bear the spice of danger. Did it work? Um, Mr. Treat? The theatre burnt down. Mr. Treat? Sir? One speck of disaster and all triumphs is forgot. But Edward, Rose, Jane? Nell, Henry, Hotspur, they fear not. They're in Shoreham at the old Cutter Inn, awaiting a ship. Fresh worlds to conquer, my boy. For which we require... Um, 70 pounds for our passage to Virginia. Well, I'll have to ask Father. Oh, for, forget I spoke. Um, but the boat leaves on Christmas Eve. Sh should you be able to visit <clears throat> before then? Mm. Pass the brandy. Is the pie good, sir? It would taste better if you'd spoken to my brother as you swore. We had a visitor, that Mr. Treat, who cared for me for 13 years. Sir John was too tired to receive him. Perhaps Mr. Treat is the principal. Well, that's plain ridiculous. I heard he was paid a thousand pounds for his pains. If Mr. Treat hadn't taken me in, I would have surely died. There was a storm that night. I was soaking wet. The principal told the stranger to let me perish if needs be. It was June. A hot summer's day. There was no storm. No. I remember it vastly well. It was your first birthday. A miraculous occasion. You were a sickly child. And none of your brothers had made six months. Which is why you were blamed, Uncle Dexter. Without me, your son Bertram stands to inherit everything when Sir John dies. It's called the entail or some such. Oh. Then why aren't I murdering you here and now? It's the entail that accuses me, not the evidence. House was full of guests. Lady Dexter truly shone with happiness. My mother? No. Your father was called away on urgent business for the estate. Then Mrs. Smith runs in, howling. He's gone. The baby's gone. Mrs. Smith? She's your nurse. Oh, she was a drunk. She was the one what dropped you and gave you that scar above your eyebrow. Your mother, on the other hand. She was as white as a sheet, oh silent as the grave. Her kind heart curdled on that day. Joseph told me that Mrs. Smith disappeared. Not till your father returned. A shadow on his face when he found out that you had been snatched. And that was a storm. A storm in his heat. He blamed the gypsies. But he never took his eyes off me. Everyone knew what he was thinking. That you'd taken me. No one paid attention to the nurse running off a few days later. Nor to the travelling player slipping out of Blackstone at the same time. Yes, but what about the stranger bringing Mr. Treat 30 guineas every June and November? Did you count the 30 guineas or was you just told of it? I... Wait, wait. Mrs. Smith had a husband. Perhaps he was the stranger. Coming twice a year to advise your Mr. Treat as to when your return might be most profitable. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Mr. Craddock would know. 
Your father's attorney. He would know if Mr. Smith is still alive. Hmm? If there's a connection between Mr. Treat and Mr. Yeah, Smith. Well, right to Craddock. Craddock knows everything. And I know that Mr. Treat loved me like his own son. But if he's guilty and has gained your affections for profit, then he'll be back calling on you for more funds and more. Beware of this, nephew George, for it points the finger of guilt somewhere you might not like. My uncle's words cast a cold shadow across my heart. So I'm glad I haven't told him of Mr. Treat's request for another 70 pounds. It has to be wrong. But if I'm so sure of Mr. Treat's honesty, then why am I awake in the middle of the night, scratching that letter to Mr. Craddock? Hope, please. Can <clears throat> you provide any information you may have about Mr. Thomas Treat and his associates? <sighs> Yours, George Dexter Esquire. I beg of you, leave now. And I beg of you to show me and Bertram just the smallest morsel of mercy. Go to the village. I will send money, but I implore you, madam, go now before he sees you. But that is the purpose of my visit. Mother? George, let me introduce you to your Aunt Dexter and your cousin Bertram. Is this him? Hello, Aunt Dexter. Oh, if it weren't for the red hair, I'd have said he was almost too handsome for a Dexter. I think I must take after my mother. Do you, George? Say good morning, Bertram. To him? Bertram! I don't want to. Say it! Good morning. Good morning, cousin. Now, you see? Now, George is returned. There's no more cause for enmity between Sir John and my husband. If Sir John could pardon him, then Richard could become a free man again, rather than a fugitive. Hunted Nothing like will come of it but aggravation and distress. Madam. Oh, Sir John. It is a joy and a relief to see you so recovered. Your no, sister-in-law was just about to take the carriage into the village. On the contrary. Christmas is upon us, and we must be hospitable. Take these unfortunate people and see that they are rested and fed. Sir John? Do as I say. Go. Madam, please, follow me. Come along, Bertram. Mother. George, wait a while. Father. I'd have you be amiable to them, boy. They are not to be blamed. Bertram doesn't seem to like me. You have everything now, and he has nothing, except the name. So take no more advantages than are yours by right. I don't understand, sir. Do you hope for my friendship and love, George? Of course, Father. Then you will understand. You will remember my wishes. Where is it? Can I help you, Mr. George? There was a letter. I have posted it for you, sir, to Mr. Craddock. But there was no address on it. Oh, I took the liberty of glancing with him. Well, you read it? You have been deceived. Most likely by Mrs. Montagu. How do you know? Who else would suggest that anyone other than Captain Richard could be the principal? You see, Mrs. Montagu has always been the closest of acquaintances to the captain. Some would say too close. Some would raise an eyebrow that it was Mrs. M who recommended Mrs. Smith to be your nurse. Some might wonder that it was Mrs. Montagu who claimed to speak the dead George Dexter from beyond the grave. Why, to stop your mother from finding you alive and well and able to inherit. That's why. Oh, it's as though the principal lurks in every shadow. Well, I defy him. Or her. Cousin George. What are you doing here? My father said I was to make you welcome. This is a library. I shouldn't think it of interest to you. There's a matter we must talk about. I doubt that very much. Cousin. Cousin Bertram, is something troubling you? Yes, Cousin George. You are. Well, I'm sorry for that. 
Why? Did you fancy we'd be friends? No. Nor enemies neither? My mother says you was brought up by vagabonds. Cheap, showy vagabonds. You certainly talk like one. You should have stayed with them. For no matter what blood runs in your veins, it wets a vagabond's heart. You're talking of blood, Cousin Bertram. Uh, your nose is bleeding. No, you're mistook, vagabond. And your eye, look, it's black and swollen. Your cheek is bruised. Your hair's pulled out and your ears and ear dragged off. What? It's a terrible gift I learned from my vagabonds. The gift of second sight. You looked a moment like you was beaten half to death. Cheap little player's trick. They're ashamed of you. Sir John, your mother... Every word you speak brings a curl to their lips. You dingy little beggar. Me a beggar? Yeah, a beggar who's never earned a farthing save by holding out his hand and whining, mm, I was born a gentleman, sir. I'm a dexter, sir. Give me my money and clothes. And you fancy yourself better than us with gaudy stage trickery and flowery actors' words? If the treat is showy, it's because they've got something worth showing. They don't think their name is all they need to make them a man. In truth, I'd rather be a treat making an honest day's pay than a, than a useless scarecrow who... Bertram? You have an audience, Cousin George. Behind you. Father. Mother. George. Bertram, leave us. Aunt. No. Let him stay. Sir John. Quiet. Sir, I spoke out of turn. But I do think of them, sir, and the treats are leaving for the new world tomorrow and from Shoreham if they can find seventy pounds. Of course. Father, you must go to them. They're not angry. Such oratory, rich and fiery. Did you not think so, madam? Indeed. Indeed, indeed. You are not injured, Bertram? No, uncle. Then tonight you will sit with each other at table, and tomorrow, George, you will take a horse and ride to Shoreham to visit your friends for one last time. You'll give me seventy pounds. And another thirty, for what you will. Confused. Amazed. At dinner, it's as if my father has been born anew. Ladies and gentlemen, a toast to George and Bertram, cousins and friends. Cousins and friends. More wine, Joseph. More wine. Bertram leans over to me, smiling for my father. But whispers in my ear. I'll destroy you, George Dexter. What's that you say, Bertram? I say to Cousin George how much I'm looking forward to Christmas, sir, and how grateful we are for your hospitality. <laughs> good. <laughs> Very good. I can barely sleep, thinking this must be some trick my father's playing on me. But when I wake, my finest treat costume, my green brocade coat, my red shoes, a silver lace waistcoat. The clothes my mother took from me are laid out. Just perfect. Magnificent. Good morning, George. Mother? Joseph has a horse ready for you in the stables. Why do you look at me like that? George. Oh, the clothes were laid out for me. If Joseph was mistaken, I can, I can no, change I again. I them there while you were sleeping. Did you? You look splendid, George. Here is a hundred pound, Mr. George, sir. Thank you, Joseph. And this is your father's blessing for his life journey. Pistol? Between here and Shoreham, there's a veritable autumn of cut purses and highwaymen. An autumn of highwaymen? They're not thick as thieves, they're thick as leaves. <laughs> Thick as leaves, I see. And God forbid you should encounter. You know who? Who? A certain captain by the name of Richard. I'll, I'll watch out for him. Well, if he should stand in your path, won't well, Joseph? There is a charge in your barrel, ready to let a little daylight into his dark head. I must be gone. <laughs> Mr. Tree cannot leave until I get the money to him. Go on. God speak, Mr. George. God speak. He's here. He's yeah. here. Just in time. Father said you'd come. Happy Christmas, geniuses. Happy Christmas, George.
George Dexter, Esquire. George Truth. George isn't a treat anymore, Hotspur. We're going to America, George. Father said you'd bring the money for the journey. Yes, I have it. The boat leaves at noon. Well, where's Mr. Tree? Here, dear boy, and charmed to see you, dear. Oh, dear George. Mr. Dexter looks pale, doesn't he, Father? Uh, not pale, child. Elegant. Elegant. Did you find out who the principal is? I thought I had. But now, I'm not so sure. You look very worried, George. And not vastly happy. Nonsense. He's rich, loved, and hugely well situated. Ain't that so, George? Yes, indeed, Mr. Treat. Couldn't you come away with us, George? I have a family, Hotspur. A father and a mother. Just the three of you? You must rustle around in that big house like three peas in a great big drum. It does sound a little lonely. Great gentlemen have no need of conversation to be content. You have to go. It's nearly noon. Yes, sir. Yes, gather your things, Treats. If only I'd got here earlier. We're not going to see you again, are we? You'll forget about us. No, Hotspur. I can never forget you. I am going to miss you so very, very much. No matter what grandness the future holds, nor what glories are to come, we'll think on you, George. Father, and our, our, our genius thoughts will conquer oceans and mountains and, and visit you in your comfort and quiet. We'll never quite be parted, dear boy. Yeah, no. Yes, of course, and um, come treats away. I'll come to the quayside with you. No, George, dear, dear George, it's better that you stay. We must look forward. Father! Not back. And they're gone. A lifetime flashes before my eyes. A lifetime of genius. A place performed, triumphs and disasters, gawping, cheering audiences. And vegetables thrown and villages chased out of. Henry snoozing in the wagon. Rose stooped over the ledger and chastising Mr. Treat for his profligacy. Edward with his nose in a book. Jane practising her ladylike airs. Little Nell too shy to speak. And even little Hotspur. Wrapping his arms around me. A lifetime. Gone. And suddenly, I feel a great rage at Mrs. Montague and Captain Richard for daring to suggest that my Mr. Treat could possibly be anything other than an honest man. I was a rogue, a monstrous old bag. And we're back! We missed the ship. I don't understand it. I think they left us behind deliberately. Well, there'll be another one in a few days. We still have the 70 pounds. Oh, no, uh, you see... <laughs> Oh, I, I paid the captain, handed him the purse, but while we were gathering ourselves, waiting to board, purchasing you know, a few essentials for the journey on the quayside, the sailors, perhaps too keen to catch the tide, cast off. <laughs> I, I shouted, Wait! You have my fare to the new world! But to no avail. The wind took my words and consequently my money. The whole 70 pounds? What's a few pounds between friends? You've plenty more after all. Is that how you think of me now? Uh, George! What's wrong, George? I'm sorry, Hotspur. I'm not sure I belong here anymore. George! Come back! Sergeant out, Captain Mistrust and Colonel Suspicion are my companions as I ride back to Blackstone. Did Mr. Treat really give the money to the captain? Is that why he stopped me from coming to the quayside? So I shouldn't see him slipping the money into his own pocket? Is that his plan? Just as my uncle suggested, to be a leech of the darkest intent. Is Mr. Treat the principal? Whoa, boy! Money! Oh, you're alive! I have 30 pounds. All right, boy. Just wait while I get my purse. Huh? You're just going to give me your money? Take out your weapon! I have no wish to fight with you, sir. You can have the money. A boy and a coward. No, I'm no coward, sir. But I'm no murderer either. Then I will have to shoot you. And you give me no choice. Fire if you dare. Whoa, what steady. Now, you, you're right. I didn't shoot. It wasn't me. No, it was me. Is he dead? Find him standing by the road an hour ago. As you approached, he slipped behind a tree, put on that mask. From that moment, my pistol was cocked. Um.
He's still alive. Not for long, I'll wager. Sir, I did not want to hurt you. Only a joke. Only a joke. <laughs> a joke. He's gone. Straight to Hades. I've never fired a gun in anger. Not sure I could have done it. Let me see that. Uh, who gave this to you? Joseph. Look, the barrel's cracked. Oh, yes. You were lucky I was here. If you'd fired your weapon, the charge would have blown back into your own face. You would have been killed for sure. How did you know I'd be on the road? Joseph was in the Dogged Shepherd this lunchtime. Mrs. Montague heard him gossiping to the landlord. I hear your Mr. Treat came to claim an early harvest. It was money for passage to Virginia. I'll wager he found some reason not to board the ship. It was 70 pounds. Hardly a fortune. The first touch of the leech is light. But once fastened, he'll suck and suck until you're dry and bloodless as a bone. Well, talking of leeches... Ah, yes. I hear you fell out with young Bertram. Do your family know you're here? No. And they mustn't. My wife is a fine woman on occasion, but her tongue is loose. She'd surely blab and soon the constables would be upon me. You trust me? More than your own son? Bertram is an oddment. But there's good in him if you dig deep enough. It's growing dark. They'll have heard the shot. You must deny everything. You cannot explain this man's death without giving me away. But you saved my life, Uncle. I'm a wanted man. This adds murder to the list of charges. What about the body? I'll bury him in the woods. With some respect, Uncle, I beg you. Of course. Although, you'll not be needing this warm cloak and hat where he's going, eh? I'll talk to my father. He was in an exceptional mood last night. Perhaps after Christmas Day, he could be open to persuasion about a reconciliation. Meanwhile, I'll stay hidden in the copse, which is safest. How will you eat? I can't take any more food without raising suspicion. There's victuals for the taking, if you know where to look. I have 30 pounds, Uncle. Left over from the money my father gave me. Take it. You're a prince, nephew. Flesh and blood, eh? George! My boy. I'm sorry, Mother. Father, the ride home took longer than I expected. Thank God. You're alive. Yes? Should I not be? We heard a shot. I heard it too. That far off, as I was passing through the cops. Your father feared the worst. I cursed myself for letting you ride alone. I reminded Sir John that you were on. I pray that you were as accomplished with the pistol as you claimed. It would have been a tragedy to lose you again. Bertram? I saw nothing. The roads were clear. Then I wonder what it was we heard. If I my Sir John, the landlord at the Dog and Shepherd complains of pilfering from his kitchen. Pies, sausages, and bread. A dangerous vagabond is suspected. <laughs> Stealing a pie is hardly dangerous. The kitchen maid was terrified by a gaunt shape, and a sinister silhouette was seen limping behind the hedgerows towards our cops. The, the landlord asks that you might need a manhunt on Boxing Day, Sir John. Oh. Sir John is not well enough. Nonsense. A hunt. Magnificent. You and me, George. Father and son hunting together. Sir? We'll see how well Mr. Tweed has taught you, cousin. I've dreamed of this day, George. Dreamed of it. Uncle? Uncle, where are you? It's me. Mr. George. Oh. Mrs. Montague, what are you doing here? I was pondering on how to get a message to you. Well, what's wrong? Where's my uncle? Uh, have you come to wish us a Merry Christmas Day? I only have a minute. No gifts. We have a gift, don't we, Mrs. Montague? Uh, a gift, indeed. Listen, you're in great danger. Tomorrow morning, my father is leading a hunt for the marauding vagabond who's been stealing pies from the dog and shepherd. And tasty pies they were, too. This isn't a joke, Uncle. I'm to accompany him and prove my qualities as a huntsman. Your life is in peril. Oh, my friend, I fear it isn't me who is being hunted. What? Show me your pistol again. There was more light this morning. Uncle, there'll be constables. And a crack in the barrel of your gun that will kill you the instant you fire. You think it was done on purpose? There. Chisel marks above the casing. 
Remember your friend, the highwayman? Goading you into firing your weapon? I'll wager he was tipped off you'd be on the road with 30 pounds in your purse. A joke to scare a boy with a pistol. He'd not have known his joke would blow you to bits. But it was Joseph gave me the weapon. Are you saying he was trying to kill me? Oh, not Joseph. He lacks the wit. Who knew you were riding alone that day? Everyone. The question is to ask if the gun room is kept locked. The question is to ask who would gain from my death. And the answer is your son, Bertram. I'm the only thing standing between him and the Dexter estate. He vowed to destroy me. But he hates me enough to kill me, Uncle. Simply because I am George Dexter. No, friend. I am not your uncle. Nor are you George Dexter. Where are we going? I was digging a grave for our highwayman friend. Looking for the most secret spot somewhere hid by the thickest thorns. He was digging a grave when he found another. Another what? Here. Another dead highwayman? No, my friend. A child. You don't have to look if you're afraid. It's just bones. Tiny bones. Old bones. An infant. No more than a year. George Dexter. George Dexter? Or the real George Treat? No. Perhaps Mr. Treat killed his own boy, seeing more profit in keeping the son of a wealthy baronet. No. Never in 10,000 years could Mr. Treat harm a living soul. Not even a landlord or a magistrate. Never mind a baby. You're mad, Mrs. Montague. Not so mad that I imagined a dead child talking to me for 13 years. And there he is, Master George. There he is that spoke to me. But if that's the real George Dexter, then someone at the manor knows you cannot be him and they want you dead. Whoever you are. The stranger. The stranger holds the key to this poor baby's demise. Cover it up again. So, my friend, it is you who are the prey tomorrow. What should I do, Uncle De Friend, take my pistol. It's near enough to twin of this murderous little instrument. What about you? If you fire that, it'll explode in your face. True. But you, George, whoever you are, you have more need of a weapon than I. I go to bed, but barely rested. My mind's a swirl with nightmares. Visions of the stranger on that stormy night in June. Take the child. Take the child. Thank you, Joseph. I'm just nervous about the hunt, that's all. There's a heavy mist rolling, Mr. George. Perhaps we should put it off for another day. It will give you the element of surprise. A bit more time to take your aim, Mr. George. Raise the gun. That's a good straight line from the hammer to your eye will do the trick nicely. Yes, Joseph. Your father is on the terrace. He's waiting for you. Where's father? He's waiting by the cops. I can't see anything. You need to follow the path. Wish me luck, mother. Are you frightened? No. Yes. 
A little. Oh, George. What is it, Mother? I'm so sorry. What do you mean, Mother? Go. Go, he's waiting. I couldn't see you in all this fog. No matter, nephew. The future. The future is all that matters now. Yes, Uncle. We'll take the corpse from three sides. I from the south, you, Bertram from the east, Sir. George from the west. But where are the others? I thought there would be officers from the town. We don't need officers, George. We're Dexters, are we not? Yes, Father. Have your pistol up and at the ready, your eyes straight ahead. Like this, cousin. Be ready to fire at the slightest movement. Rest me, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay. Except the principal, or the stranger, or whoever it was killed that little baby. Let nothing you dismay. Except someone lurking in this mist what wants to kill me. Who's that? George, it's me. Mr. Treat? Dr. George. More lies, Mr. Treat. Trust me, George, there's someone you must meet. But I don't trust you, Mr. Treat. He's here, in the clearing. Suddenly I can't breathe. For the damp black cloak, the roomy pinpoint eyes and the tricorn hat, like the horns of the devil himself, silhouetted in the swirling mists. It's the stranger. Hello, George. Get away from me. You devil. No, George! Wait, you're a devil too! A scoundrel! George! And leave me alone! It's true. It's true, it's true. Look at me. Sir John, who's he talking to? I said turn around. It's Captain Richard. Except... I paid you ten pounds to waylay the boy. Except the captain's wearing the dead man's cloak and hat. You could have had another thirty, but he never set eyes on you. Through the mist, Sir John thinks he's talking to my highwayman. You contemptible little thief. No, father, stop! Ah, boy. Good, good, good. That's him. Shoot, boy. Shoot before he escapes. I can't. Don't be afraid, boy. Hold the weapon up. Your eye to the hammer. Aim and fire. Fire, boy, fire. Why don't you use your pistol, father? Because I command you to fire. I command you. Do it, boy. And what will happen then, Sir John? What are you talking about? You're the principal, aren't you? It's you. You want me to kill myself with a broken gun? I want you to save the village from a thief and a vagabond. That isn't him, Sir John. Well, who is it then? It's me, brother. No! Oh, you! Always you! George, run! Run! No! Oh, my leg! It is broken! I can always beat you in a fight, brother. And look at my prize! Your pistol. The pistol I shall shoot the boy with. You'll get the blame, of course, after I've killed you, too. Why don't you run, boy? Oh, sir, please, don't fire it. It gives me no joy to do this, boy, but I must. I made the most terrible mistake. When my beautiful little George died in his cot, quite naturally, I promise you, it was his birthday. Unbearable. Impossible. The entail demanded the estate would go to Bertram when I died. I panicked, pretended to be called away on business, buried George in the woods. I contacted my attorney, Mr. Craddock, told him the boy had been kidnapped, that he might never be returned. I told him to find another red-headed infant to strike a bargain with the boy's father for the day when I would need an heir again. Mr. Craddock was the stranger. Why did you go with me into... Dueling with you to make you a murderer. To have you arraigned and hanged. To destroy your family once and for all. You are mad, brother. Bedlam mad. You are a coward. You tried to miss. Where is your pride, Richard? I had to fall into the path of your bullet. I don't understand. After all that, you're going to kill me. It was a mistake. You are not my son. You are... Too coarse, too bright, too gentle, too handsome. 
You've seen the portraits, George. All the Dexters, the way they stare at me, accusing. I have to recover, find a different way. Because I can't let you take it, George. I cannot let you live. Don't shoot, sir. Sir John, I'm afraid, has left us. The pistol exploded in his face. Oh. We must get you to the house. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Craddock. I tried to warn him. Dear, dear George. Don't touch me. I never want to speak to you again. Dr. Newby has been summoned. I don't understand, George. Why won't you come with me? You lied to me about everything. Your brothers and sisters are waiting for you. Are you sure you haven't sold any of them? A bargain fed and clothed us for 13 years. I never imagined it would have to be repaid. Well, then you are not the genius that I thought you but were. But then when it was, it meant sending you to a world of riches such as us streets could only dream about. I've got George Dexter's scar above my eyebrow. You cut me with a knife for 60 guineas a year. Now that was my doing. Your father ran from the room. I stopped up my ears. What kind of a father would let his son be hurt by anyone? One who loves you more dearly than anything in the world. Well, after what I've learned today, I don't have a father. You have a father in me, George, if you so desire. I would be proud to call you my son. Father, no! Quiet! I changed 50 of you for one of him. Mr. Treat, sir, will you consent? Hold a moment, Captain. I believe I have first claim. How so? I knew from the day he arrived, as only a mother can, that he was not my son. But, George, I have grown to love you, as only a mother can. We might do much for each other, George. Mr. Treat, you must decide. Another thousand pounds, Mr. Treat. Two thousand. No, no, no. George Treat is my son, and he's not for sale. You didn't say that 13 years ago. Because there was a storm that sunny day in June, a storm raging in my heart, and it's been raging ever since. A storm that can never abate unless, dear George, please, please, unless you agree to be my son again. And he looks at me, and his eyes are quite moist, as are mine, quite afloat with tears. George. Oh, Father. My Father. So, I am a treat once more. George, the gentleman genius! The gentleman genius! Back in Blackstone. The manor is somewhat more cheerful these days, although mists will always inhabit the copse, swirling through the silver birches. But at least a dead little gentleman sleeps in the churchyard now, next to his father, and talks to Mrs. Montague no more. In episode two of Devil in the Fog by Leon Garfield, George was played by Joe Dempsey, Captain Richard by Ben Crow, Mrs. Montague, Joanna Munro, Sir John, Sam Dale, Lady Dexter, Juliet Aubrey, and Joseph and Mr. Craddock by Sean Baker. Mr. Treat was Tim McMullen, Aunt Dexter, Claire Harry, Bertram, George Sanderson, and the highwayman was Henry DeVass. Hotspur was played by Raymond Karemi Teheri, Rose, Fern Deacon, Edward, Hugo Docking, and Jane, Lauren Moat. Devil in the Fog was dramatized by Martin Jameson, and the director was Mark Beebe. In tomorrow's drama here on 4 Extra, a drought uncovers a woman's childhood home which had been submerged in a reservoir. The drought by Stephen Dunstone is tomorrow at the same time. Now, have you ever wondered what a comedian gets up to before a gig? Warming up. The backstage habits and rituals of comedians. 
Hello, my name is Tony Law, and before a gig, I like to have a costume to change into, usually when I'm doing uh, tours or Edinburgh or things like that. And I like to pace a lot, and I like to wander off and make people worry that I'm not going to arrive. And when I'm doing gigs where I don't have a chance to change into a outfit, I like to arrive really, really late, and because I, I really enjoy the stress of people texting, say, where are you, how far are you away, and even though I'm only five minutes away, sometimes I stand outside. Uh, I know it makes me uh, probably a jerk, but I'm always there, I always make it, but I, I think it's just distraction. I like to be distracted, so pacing, wandering, being late, and changing into clothes. So I love, I love doing a tour show where you got a mirror and you're just all on your own and you just look at yourself the whole time. And, you know, just pretend that you don't look awful. Just go.